Welcome along everybody to uh, this very special occasion today. This is a, an occasion that has been um, organised by Prem from our uh, Buddhist community, uh, an organisation to celebrate 70 years of, uh, uh, of the life of Ajahn Brahm. Um, you can see that we've got set up beside us uh, here uh, uh, an image of him. I think it's an image when he was a little bit younger, but nonetheless, you can see that even in this image, he's holding uh, the silver leaf, which I think uh, signifies in the Thai tradition his, uh, his great uh, merit and his great uh, contribution to Buddhism um, over the years. And, and I know this photo was probably taken quite a few years ago because Ajahn Brahm certainly does look a bit younger there and uh, perhaps, may I say, a little bit thinner as well. But again, uh, back in those years, we were all uh, we were all that way, younger and thinner. Um, Prem has asked me just to uh, to iterate, really, to you all, all of you that are taking part in this wonderful uh, wonderful thing that we're doing for Ajahn Brahm over the, over the uh, over these uh, seven days before his actual birthday, which is on the seventh of August. Um, he would just like me to uh, emphasise for you the, the absolute power of really what we're doing, because this is a worldwide event. It's uh, an event where people from right around the world are going to be uh, uh, joining in this uh, meta celebration, meta, where we're, we're guiding this loving kindness energy, this energy towards Ajahn Brahm in a very powerful way because as, uh, as Brem, Prem has been pointing out to us all, this is a very powerful thing to do. Uh, the virtues of meditation are certainly well and truly recognised in the way that the Buddha lived his life and in the way that he was able to describe and, uh, and, and lay out the teachings of the Buddha for us uh, all those years ago, 2,600 years ago. and. Um, he was always uh, very, very encouraging of people to support the monastic order. Uh, in fact, uh, indeed, the f he always talked about the four pillars of Buddhism. And indeed, uh, uh, myself as a lay person, I kind of uh, am very uh, pleased and, and grateful too to be inside and, and there supporting these four pillars that the Buddha talked about of Buddhism, this, the, uh, the four pillars of, of, of strong lay men, the pillar of strong lay women, and also the pillar of ordained nuns, and the pillar of ordained monks. Rajan Brahm has been a, a monk now for many, many years, and uh, uh, I've known him too uh, ever since he's been here in Perth uh, when he came uh, all those years ago. And uh, I've kind of watched the way that he has grown and not only just, I mean, I think he's always been a very spiritually inclined person and also always a very, very uh, a powerful meditator. But it's been wonderful to see the way that he's been able to engage the world, as it were, uh, in this, this whole process of, um, of the Buddha's teachings. And the idea of of um, of doing this meditation today, this this wonderful metta meditation on his behalf and through him and for him, uh, to celebrate his 70 years here on this earth is really quite a special a special thing to do. Now Prem has also uh, uh, just wanted me to emphasise that this is a coordinated worldwide effort. Uh, and it's a powerful project to mark Ajahn's 70th birthday. And uh, in a moment, I'll sort of start by offering a little bit of guidance to start this meditation. We'll be together for about an hour. So uh, with that, I would like you to just settle back in and settle back to the uh, in your seats or however you're sitting, however you are um, 
taking part in this today or wherever you're taking part in this, just to settle back and just for the first few moments, uh, just relax and just let your, um, your mind and your body become as still as it possibly can. Just while I uh, try to uh, just guide and just gently uh, show and present to you just the way that we'll do this session today so that uh, we can all be quite sure of what we're doing. Um, this meta meditation really uh, is, uh, a, it is a powerful meditation because it, it, it allows us really to use our emotional side, the emotional side of our life. I mean, as human beings, we do live our lives um, with both our head, our intellect, but there's also sometimes that we forget about this really, but there's also this emotional side, the head and the heart or the stomach is really just where you normally feel these feelings usually, not so much in the head, which is more, usually more uh, centered around intellectual thought and so on. But when these two things, the head and the heart, can come together, this is a very, very powerful thing to happen because it then allows us to, to settle into uh, what it is to be really fully human, a full, fully human being, uh, a person that's living on this earth, a person that's living in this universe. Uh, and when we are able to sort of settle into that and not so much to be able to uh, to be fighting it or changing what it, however we are the the way that that uh, that nature has has evolved to uh, to allow us to be the human beings that we are and also the other animals that are around us and all of the all of the 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 manifestations of this universe really is all really there right there in our conscious creation, right there in our mind, consciously. We can consciously feel and understand all of this, the, the way that the, the intellect and the mind sort of thinks about all of this, but also the way that we feel, the way that we feel into the different things that we do. And all this does give us a guidance and gives us a way to, uh, um, to, to go forward and, and, and to to live in a way that's, that's balanced. But more importantly, as the Buddha talked about too, it, it actually gives us this very powerful um, ability to self-reflect. When all of that is there and we're balanced, and when we're balanced as human, human beings, we do have this ability to look back on ourselves, to look back on our minds, to see how we are feeling, to see how we are thinking. And we can make uh, from there good judgments about things, good judgments about whether or not uh, we're doing things right, or if we're, we're, in a way, if we're soiling our nest, if you like, if you know, as we now look to the climate change of today and all of the other uh, trials and tribulations that come up for humanity as we live in this world, we need, and this ability to reflect shows us that we do need to live uh, sustainably in this world, in, in an environmental, environmentally friendly way that is harmonious for all of the other uh, manifestations of consciousness that surround, because we are all part of that. We're a part of, of this whole world, this whole ecosystem. And more to the point, when the Buddha was talking about this, he was making it very clear that we can also um, live our lives in such a way that we can actually come right to the truth, right to the very truth that's in the heart of the of the present moment that we we as meditators try to to understand and be with. And when we can uh, allow ourselves to be and unify all of our, all of our disparate uh, energies, the, the, the disparate way that we, we kind of get caught into the extremes of, of living, we do start to see that balance. We can start to see the truth and the power that is right there in, in the present moment. 
And there's nothing more uh, powerful in doing this than when we're doing or using metta meditation. I mean, as Buddhists, we're all very familiar with metta meditation and just the way that it works. Uh, and we know, and even the Buddha has said, that it's a very powerful meditation. It's a meditation that, it actually, that act, can actually take you right through to enlightenment. And it is, and is actually needed, really, needed in the whole mix to, to, to take you there, to take you right into the heart of the truth. You know, without this, uh, this ability to, to self-reflect and see and see how you fit into things and see how we, as, as, as humanity, fits, fits into this, this world so that we can uh, work to develop peace and tranquility in this world, uh, well, then we, you know, we, we really remain, as it were, trapped in this in this world of samsara, this ongoing world that we can uh, we can start to see as we practice um, this uh, Buddhist path, start to see and understand the way that that past lives work, the way that rebirth happens, the way that uh, that conditioning works, and indeed the Buddha. Uh, set out many, many teachings to help us understand this, this way of, um, of, of looking at things, this Buddhist way of, of, of looking at these things. And I'm thinking here about the 12 steps in the path of dependent origination. Um, and just the way that that is really quite a wonderful, a wonderful way to, uh, to come to this understanding of what's there for us to see and to notice in the heart of the present moment. Now, for today, though, I wanted to be able to uh, just to talk to us all, just as you're sitting there, and I trust, I trust and hope that you're, you're being quite still and relaxed, and as you're just listening, there's no need to really try and understand too much what I'm saying. Don't, uh, you don't need to, uh, you know, to try and work things out or, you know, to, to make choices or decisions about whether I'm, what I'm saying is right or whether I could have said it better or different things like that. It's just more or less the idea just to let the words wash over you and just, just allow yourself to, becoming, to become as still as you possibly can become so that your body is nicely relaxed. And then as that happens, then your mind also can be relaxed as it sort of sits and fits into the present moment. So... I really wanted to just start by uh, alerting you to, as you probably already know anyway, most of you, just in the way that Ajahn Brahm actually usually teaches this meditation for himself. And, uh, and for him to set himself up with this emotional uh, uh, condition that's, that, that helps him with this metta meditation, he usually thinks of a nice furry or a cuddly animal, like a cat. In fact, I've heard many people uh, sort of talk about uh, Ajahn's uh, pussy cat or uh, uh, cat meditation for, for, for metta. And it's a wonderful, wonderful way that, it, that, uh, that he presents that because it is when you're sort of thinking of, 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 of a helpless animal, a helpless creature that you find and you can, uh, you can see that it actually needs your help. It needs your compassion. It does need your loving kindness. Uh, it needs all of these things for it to be, uh, for, for it to live and to thrive in this in this world. And uh, and he often uses that. Just has in his mind just this little kitten, this little kitten that perhaps is you know you could even think of it as maybe hungry and sort of feel uh, and know that you can you can maybe alleviate that hunger and sort of help satisfy it, bring it back into balance with itself. So that's, that's the kind of emotional um, um, input that he puts into himself to do this so that he can project that out onto that feeling, that same feeling, not necessarily the, the idea of the cat or the pussy, the little kitten, but the, uh, the feeling, the emotional feeling that he can then put out into the world, and you see this in what he does and the way that he works this way. I mean, he was the founder of this word kindfulness, wasn't he? 
uh, Ajahn Brahm has always talked about uh, about this practice and the need for, for need for us to be kind to each other. And this is really something that you, as you live with him over the years, you kind of notice that he that he is this way. There is really nothing um, uh, incongruent in him about that. It's it's whenever. And one of the wonderful things that I notice about living with Ajahn Brahm and being with Ajahn Brahm over the years is that he does have this congruence. You know, the way that he teaches, the way that he, uh, that he lives his life, it is very, very congruent. Very, so what he, what he says is really how, what he practices. Um, now there can always be, you know, there's I mean, even myself, you know, you know, there's times when you when you maybe you know, get get a little bit at loggerheads with things. This is the same as he has with uh, no doubt with me or with uh, with others too. But there is always at the back of his mind this way of moving through any trials and tribulations or any troubles that might arise with kindness being kind and always being able to project that feeling of warmth, that feeling of uh, nurture and loving kindness out into the situation that he's, he's dealing with. Now for me, when I uh, see this, I kind of see now that, uh, that when I'm doing that, it's very, very beneficial for my own life, for my own practice. Because you start to see, I think, with this practice, as you, as I'm sure that some of you, or most of you, hopefully, have started to realise, is that this world is really, and as the Buddha said himself, this world is in our minds. It's a mental construct, um, and it's and it's um, it develops, and and you know, eventually. Uh, gets uh, to the state where it where it, where it fuses into what we see, into the way that we kind of can live in this world. We're living in a habitual way in this world, where where this um, the conditions of life are are, are there, and they they've manifested uh, through our well through our ignorance mainly uh, in. Uh, in this way now that we kind of perceive this world and understand this world to be external from us. But that in actual fact is not really the truth. When we look out into this world, and I would encourage you to sort of even to, to, to see it this way if you can, or practice to see it this way, to, to see that you're looking out through your own, your own mind, looking out, you're looking directly into your own mind. But it's when I'm looking out here into this world, into this hall here at Dharmaloka, I'm looking into Dennis's world. This is my world for, for me to see, and it's up to me, in a way, to make that world peaceful. You know, I can't, Ajahn Brahm can't do that for me, the same as I wouldn't be able to do that for Ajahn Brahm, but, uh, but when he's looking out into this world, it's, it's his world. When the Buddha was looking out into the world uh, in his time, that was his world that he was looking out into. So we, we all are responsible for, for the way that we, the, the way that we react, the way that we relate, our relationship with this world is really the most important thing to see. And, uh, and this metta meditation certainly is, is a way that we can uh, use this emotional side of our life, this feeling side of our life, to uh, to be able to be to bring up this kindness and this love, this uh, knowledge that we are part of all of this, that we are connected into this world, we are part of this earth. You know, in fact, we uh, we live on this earth. We eat up all of its vegetables and its its growth and its all the the bounty that comes from the earth is our food. There's the water that we drink that's also uh, that goes into us and makes us part of this world. We're born into this world, and we when we die, we go back into this world. We are part of it. We're connected into it, and. By extension to that too, I'd also like to just bring in the idea that this world 
and all of that connection to then extends out into the universe. So the universe itself, indeed, even all of the parts, all of the, the makeup of my body, the makeup of your body, this is all the elements that make all of that up, really does come from the, the stars because the stars is where all the elements are made. It's the only place that, well, certainly any elements heavier than iron are definitely made in stars and they come about in, the, in these titanic uh, explosions, these supernova explosions and so on that, that happen very, very often out in the universe, all the time seeding the universe with all of these, all of this, uh, this um, uh, physical conditioning that really then comes back into us. This earth has certainly been through two or three cycles of conditioning and, uh, and the elements that are in our bodies all come from the universe. So we can see from that that we are really part of this universe as well as that we're part of this earth. And uh, just in a moment, I would like, when we start this little meditation practice, I would like to do a little exercise of grounding, just to ground us into uh, this seat that we're sitting in, into this earth, and really just acknowledge just the presence of the universe and just how all of this really is in our minds. It's inside our consciousness. And this will become quite apparent, I hope, to just guide you very gently uh, into uh, this stillness, this still consciousness, which can be found and, and is just very readily seen right in the heart of the present moment. It is a condition that you can, you can uh, cultivate, you can amplify it up, and indeed use this still consciousness, this stillness of mind, as, as, a, as a datum for your life, as a datum to reflect from. And when we start doing that, it becomes more and more apparent then for us to see that this world is inside our mind. It's a mind-made universe. And, of course, when we start to see that, we can start to understand why uh, it's so powerful to do a meta meditation like this today and really to channel it through, bring it through someone as powerful as Ajahn Brahm's teachings have been around the world and the way that uh, to bring it through the power of the way that he stands, the way that he, the way that he um, relates to, to the world, to take all of this, um, to give all this uh, uh, and focus this energy back to him. And we can see, as Prem has been uh, pointing out, I think, for all of us here, that this is a very powerful way to do this, to, in the same way that it was in the time of the Buddha, to, uh, to allow the Buddha's teachings to, to just explode in the way that they certainly have exploded through Ajahn Brahm's good offices here into the world since he's been here in the BSWA and been able to... Um, uh, to to meet and and uh, work with people all around of the world. You know his teachings, his the way that he's able to have this ability to um, uh, to talk about and 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 to um, uh, identify what the Dharma is and just how to how to live it, how to be with it. All of that has exploded into the world really since he's been here. And this is our opportunity too in this practice to help all of that along, to give all of that uh, voice that Ajahn Brahm has been spreading out into the world, a voice uh, with the, the meta meditation that we're going to generate here uh, today. So with those few words, I'd like now for you just to settle down and uh, settle right into yourself. And I'm going to ask you, first of all, just to take a few deep breaths and just, just, just to see yourself sitting. And then as you are watching yourself, we, it is always useful just to just do a very quick scan through your body, just 
hopefully that you're already quite relaxed. But you can just start with your body and just maybe uh, feel for a toe somewhere, a, a big toe, or a, you can pick any toe you like. Just feel it in your socks or feel it on the floor. And then just allow yourself to run over your foot, over your arch, over the arch of your foot into your heel, then up into the ankle area, just where it's articulated onto your foot, and then connected to the lower part of your leg, to the shins. And as you're moving up through there, you might just stop and just notice the, the calves, the calf muscles the nice floppiness of that. Then moving up through the knees, up into the thighs. And if there just does happen to be any tension there in the knees, any kind of uh, feeling of being caught or, or stressed there, you can just, just pay a little bit more attention to it and just allow it to relax. Just move gently if you need to. But just let yourself become so relaxed and moving up into the thigh areas, the big muscles in your legs there. And then through your bottom and just feeling the way that your bottom is pulled down into your seat, whatever that may be. Then moving up through into the lower part of the back. Just balancing up that nice straight back with that little curvature right at the base of your spine. So you can feel all that and feel that it's nicely balanced. And then round your tummy. And up into the upper chest. And remember when you do have time to do this, you can always just stop and linger around these places in your tummy and in your chest because there is always plenty of movement and things happening in there, plenty of gurgles and rumbles and up into your chest, the rhythms of your heart and the way that everything clanks and opens and closes. You really feel into there, you can sort of notice it all happening and just really become quite grateful. I mean, when I do this, it becomes quite, I become quite grateful just to know that this body is doing all this to keep me alive. There's a gratitude there for that. For me now, I'm a couple of years older than Ajahn Brahm even. I'm 72 years old now, but my body's been working like this for all of these years. And you can think of Ajahn Brahm's body too as 70 years old now, but still working very, very well. And then moving up into your, the upper back then round your shoulders and your shoulder blades, and then feeling the way your arms hang down by your sides, bent at the elbows, and then moving into the forearms and your wrists and your hands, into your fingers. I always find this too to be very nice part of practice, just the feeling into my fingers because there's a lot of energy that's there. And oftentimes I can experience that as a, like a, a tingling, like an effervescent feeling, a buzzing feeling. And sometimes if I'm lucky, it even, and if I'm relaxed enough, and even just expands into the rest of my body. I can sort of feel that tingling in my body around the extremities of it. And 
And this is a good sign because it's really showing us that we are starting to relax. If you can notice something like that, it means that you are relaxing. There's a relaxation that's starting to happen. Then moving your attention up through your neck and into your head. Just making sure the head's nicely balanced on your shoulders. Nice, feeling nice behind your eyes. And if there are any tensions there behind your eyes, any tensions at all, just, just focus and just let them relax. Round your lips, up into the top of your head. And then just to see yourself sitting. And now even just feeling the way that we're sitting and even starting to intuit or notice the way that gravity is holding us into our seat. And the way that we are anchored to this earth. The energetic field lines of gravity are are working to keep us the way that we are on the surface of this earth. And as your mind settles, you might even start to see how these field lines are going round and round, going down deep into the earth, to the centre of the earth, coming back up to contain you, keeping you safe. And then at the same time, these energetic field lines are also extending out into the universe. They're expanding right out into the universe. Out beyond even our Milky Way galaxy out into all the clusters of galaxies, into that huge spaciousness that's there, this spaciousness that is just so apparent in our mind, this emptiness. And we can intuit out there too, just the stillness of space, the way that this space is, so quiet. Still. And I point all this out in this metta meditation because I think it is very important to realise that we are part of this earth and part of this universe. The way that we are connected to it all. And then also by extension we're connected to each other. One human being is not really that much different to another in terms of the way we are conditioned and live our lives. We're all caught in this cycle, the cycle of samsara. Breaths coming in and breaths going out. Days finishing, days beginning. Weeks beginning, weeks ending. And even lifetimes beginning, lifetimes ending. Only to condition new lives. All connected in this paradoxical mind stream.
where at one level you can see that this mind stream that I'm working with is mine, it's Dennis's mind stream. And the mind stream you're working with is yours, it's your mind stream. Your grasping and holding on to your world. This is your world. And what I'm looking out on is my world. But we can see that it's all connected. There's this paradox. But then now as we settle and allow ourselves to go deeper into the mind, and I'd like you to do that now, just to allow yourselves to let go of the body and just to settle into the mind. There's no need to think, no need to try and work it out. Just let your mind settle into the space, the stillness, the emptiness of your mind. Knowing that this smaller picture is really just a resonance of the bigger picture. But that stillness is there. You can notice that stillness and feel that still consciousness. The stillness of consciousness. And you can, we can then start to know that it is in this place, in this stillness, this stillness of mind, where all of those paradoxes unify. It's this still consciousness, this, the fifth candor. Consciousness. Where everything starts to unify. And I trust now that you are able to be in touch with that stillness, with that still aspect of your mind. And it's here that I would like to invite you to bring in now, to bring in this meta side of the meditation. If you like, you can follow Ajahn Brahm's lead and bring in the feelings that you might have for a, a helpless and a needy animal. It might be that you have more direct experience with your own children, whether you're a mother or a father. That compassionate feeling, that feeling of needing and being almost compelled to look after, to nurture, to see the vulnerability of this little child or this animal. Or indeed, if you liked, you could even sort of extend that feeling really to this whole world. All the trees and the forests. The way that we do need We need to and we, we practice to nurture, to be kind to all of the creatures, all of the animals. Because they are all part of our universe, they're part of our world.
So I'd like you just to develop that feeling, just develop that palpable feeling of, of compassion, of love, tenderness. And as you're doing that, just notice what it does to your own mind. Notice how when you do that, it brings joy into your mind, joy into your life. It brings happiness. And most important to notice, I think, too, is just the beauty that starts to become apparent as you're just practicing to infuse this feeling of loving kindness into the world. <clears throat> And I'd like you just to allow that feeling to build in your heart. Just to turn your attention now to your heart, just around the middle of your chest. If you need to, you might even like to just bring your hand up to your chest so that you can feel the area that you're working with. And just to bring this tender energy, this beautiful energy of loving kindness bring it up into your heart this wonderful compassion there's a warmth to it but yet it's not hot it's in fact, cool, like a balm, balanced. It's a balanced, beautiful feeling. And I trust you can just feel the subtle pleasure that it's bringing into your heart. May all beings be well and happy. May I be well and happy. And I'd like you just to keep allowing that energy to build so that it's moving right through your body from the tips of your toes right through to the top of your head. energy that's almost pressing against the inside of your skin. And keeping your body just so relaxed. So warm. So tender and loving. And then as you're building that energy up inside you, I would like you to then first of all, bring Ajahn Brahm's photo, the photo that's there in front of us on the easel, or your memory of him. Bring him into your mind. And then just allow this surplus of beautiful loving-kindness energy 
just to allow it to flow into Ajahn Brahm. Allow this energy to be there. And to give it to him generously. Generously in the knowledge that this energy will be multiplied. It will increase exponentially. as it moves from you into him and out into the world. In a way, we're using Ajahn Brahm as a conduit to amplify this loving energy that we have. And giving him the ability to use this energy powerfully and lovingly May Ajahn Brahm <clears throat> live a long life and may he always have the ability to bring this Dharma to the world, to bring this truth, this beauty to the world. And I'd like you now just to continue to build that energy up inside yourself, this loving energy, loving kindness. And use it whichever way you want, just to see it going through Ajahn Brahm or out towards whatever is taking your mind whatever your mind is taking it towards. Just to let this energy expand and be free in this world. And then by extension, this loving energy will be free in your own mind. So I'm just going to be silent now for about five or ten minutes while we just allow this beautiful loving energy to build.
So we're coming up <clears throat> towards the end of this meditation, but just before you uh, move away from this beautiful generation of metta, I would like you just to perhaps just reflect on how your mind is now, and just to notice where the five hindrances are at the present time. Just notice that in your mind it's quite still and that stillness is quite powerful, it's quite a powerful energy. And we've just been using that energy too to in a way heal, balance the world. We've been able to use Ajahn Brahm's good offices to use the images that we images and the knowledge that we have of him to direct some of this energy through and out into places perhaps that we can't quite reach. But nonetheless, when we look at the mind now, it's quite still. There's no desires, there's no grasping, not noticing, not noticing the, any desires coming into the mind or indeed any aversions, the opposite of that. The desires and aversions have abated. And if you notice, there is just contentment that's left. Contentment in your mind. And then hopefully for you, as you look a little differently or a little bit deeper, you can notice too that your body and your mind is quite balanced. The restlessness and the sloth and torpor that sometimes can be there or the tiredness of your mind is not there because your mind is bright, alert. But it's not restless, it's just observing and working to develop cultivate this beauty that abounds in compassion and loving kindness. So the restlessness is abated and any tiredness or slothfulness is not there. The body is quite, and the body and the mind is quite balanced, happy, joyful even. And even look to see that there is great beauty. Indeed, as you look even further, it's almost sort of overwhelming because you can recognize that you are moving towards truth, truth of this present moment. The mind's not lingering in the past or trying to grasp onto the future. It's nicely balanced. soft and it's kind, tender and gentle. Where you, and you realize that wherever you, you really want to, you can direct this energy, this beautiful loving energy. You can also notice that all of this is inside your mind. So that in a moment when I ring the bell, you'll be able to see that stillness, bring it back into the room where you are, into the place where you are. And as your eyes open and you start to use your senses 
the five senses, you'll notice that this stillness is still buzzing around them, around the around that consciousness of seeing, around that consciousness of hearing, tasting, touching, feeling. It's still consciousness is abundant, it's everywhere. So now I'm going to ring the bell and at the end of the third ringing you can just open your eyes and just rest for a little more and then we'll just share the merits of what we have done. I would like to offer, on behalf of us all, the merits of uh, all that we've done here today to Ajahn Brahm, but also for each and every one of you, every one of you participating in this event, to be able to share the merits with your family, with your friends, with all the people in the world, with all the animals in the world.